are back. Hello, welcome back, everybody. That was actually a nice transition. That was a really good transition. Once. I think Shout it's your best yet, Shores. Yeah. Um, yeah, not to toot my own horn, but <laughs> I mean, best of a bad bunch. Let's face it. Choo choo. Yeah. Oh, hey. You can, I know, you can still learn. You can still learn. That's, that's that true. one time yeah. I played Taylor Swift, I don't regret no, it. No, Sarah, you've been permanently removed from all music. Which is just that was not a regrettable fair. choice. Yeah. That was it. Was regrettable. It was funny. It was better than Revenge. And we were talking about colonialism. I laughed. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just no. Whatever. Whatever. Listen, no. it doesn't matter. How, have we, how has our weeks been? Have they been pleasurable? <laughs> <laughs> Good God. You could not oh, phrase that any worse. Uh, yeah, that was yes, they have been pleasurable. No, I realized. <laughs> I've I, gained a lot of pleasure. Thank you, Shoros. Yeah. I realized the moment I said it, I was like, that's not the word I was aiming for. No, yeah. maybe it was. Have we had no. good weeks? Yes. That, yeah. There we go. Thank you. Well yep. done. Did we, out. did we learn anything? Did we learn anything? Every, every day is a school day. Obviously. Every day is a school that day. You're true. right. That um, is true. Obviously, you... I can't speak for you, well, history buffs, but yeah. Um, no, yeah. That's true. I've been working Nothing on my, historical related. my history essay for the last week, actually, oh, yeah? which is Operation Barbarossa. Um, if you don't know what that is, that's when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union. If you don't know what that is, have a talk with yourself. Like, <laughs> just, come it's on. the biggest land <laughs> Firstly, invasion li- in history. Why are you listening to a history show? <laughs> yeah. yeah like, Get <laughs> um, But yeah, so I've just been doing kind of a lot of research into that, and then now I have to make a presentation, um, so that's what I'm also working on, on uh, Hitler's impact on the Soviet Union. Wow. Riveting. Thank is you, there sir. one fact you've learned this week that you didn't know the week before? About Operation Barbarossa. Well, it could be anything, but just about life. Okay, in I'm gonna make it about. I'm gonna make it Operation Barbarossa because that's what I learned about. Um, <laughs> Hitler made a lot of plans where he was like, "It's okay, we'll just take the Soviet Union's resources when we get there," and that was kind of his his big idea. Is we don't need to then deal with supply lines for a ton of food and stuff like that. Um, but what he didn't realize is a lot of that was contingent on Soviet oil, which he really wanted, and Hitler had been like sending him and stuff like that, which is fine. But he, I don't know if he didn't know this, it's unclear, okay, mm-hmm. but he, he can't, he couldn't use Soviet oil without building a sort of transition thing um, to change the oil to then insert it into his tank. So all oh. this Soviet oil that he was going in, like, taking Soviet oil fields, unless Stalin burned them first, which did happen in some cases, was completely <laughs> useless to him because it wouldn't work in German tanks, so he filled Buzz. up with a diesel pump, is what you're saying. You basically, he got there and he was like, well, we our tanks are just not, <laughs> just can't use. R- Russia also um. didn't have a lot of infrastructure roads-wise, so he also couldn't use his tanks there. And he then sent none of his soldiers with coats. And just yeah, bad about, choices about, all the way around. But they didn't, they didn't <laughs> yeah. actually reach like the big oil fields though, around the Caucasus, though, did they? They didn't actually reach that far. Uh, no, uh, no, they got stopped at, uh, at Stalingrad. Yeah, yeah the so famous, they never actually reached yeah, the, the famous fields. battle, perhaps. No, but that thing. was his plan. Is he was like, because that's part of the reason he wanted the Soviet Union. So he was like, then we don't, they don't have to give us their oil. We'll just have their oil, and also we want their food, which I thought was really interesting because you know Ukraine, man, they didn't have a lot of that in well, <laughs> the apart Soviet from Union. Ukraine, yeah, yeah, exactly. Basket. So, don't know. There were a lot of interesting choices made. There. I accidentally referred. Was it last show that referred to a bread basket as a basket case? Oh, you yeah. might have, yeah. called, I called it. Oh no, I called it Egypt, the basket case of Europe, <laughs> of the Mediterranean. Oh my that was, I think uh, I think High Guys tour to Kiev might be a uh, shelled for now. <laughs> that's yours, but. Shelled. Yeah, oh. they might. They might not be a movie that one. Shelled. Oh. That's Donetsk, mate. <laughs> wow. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah. You need to. You need to kind of work. Uh, if anyone's shorts. wondering what I'm doing right now, I'm opening up the small claims court yet again. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Episode ten. Do you want to remind our listeners just in case they haven't yeah, tuned so in before last, what that is? Last episode. We decided, you know what, enough of us actually saying we're going to record every controversial statement we make. We actually are going to record this it. This time we're statement. actually recording every controversial statement. Well, that wasn't really a claim, I feel, what we just said. No, that wasn't. Talking about Donetsk being shelled. Yeah, that was more just poor taste, um, more than anything. But for us, I must apologize, Ukrainian government, if you're listening in. Um, I don't know, yeah. I think they've probably got more pressing matters, sure. I don't know. You know, the east of their country getting invaded and whatever. What they about, might need a laugh, though. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> what about you, Dino? Did you did you learn anything last week? You got one um, fact you can tell us about something you learned about. Well, you know, I've been doing a doing an essay on church state relationships in the US and the UK, uh due in for tomorrow. Just um just a lot of religion I've had to take in. Uh, a lot of history. Um Good. Like, just, well, <laughs> the religious context, obviously. Mm. That's that's mainly been based around um, facts, facts, facts. To be honest, nothing I didn't already know in that sense. Mm, that's I hate to, hate to disappoint you, but 
Yeah. Mm. Religion has quite a turbulent history in, in, in the UK, obviously. And I think there's still a big hangover, you know, from days, centuries past, when obviously Christianity had a massive sway in the country. You know, for example, House of Lords, you know, consisting of many bishops. I didn't know that. Queen of England being ceremonial head of the Church of England. You know, I think these are all yeah. things that... I did a, know that. <laughs> in a modern secular society, these are all things that probably wouldn't be allowed. So is it, are you looking at how these sort of, like, these remnants of... Well, yeah, I was basically arguing that uh, the formal situation for church-state relationships in the UK is kind of a relic of centuries past, when obviously Christianity held a massive sway, but obviously now that it's a highly secularised country, um, is it really the case anymore? Yeah. I don't think you could pull off wars of religion anymore. That's a very large claim. Not in the UK. Yeah. yeah Certainly that not in the UK, bio. yeah. Um, no, that's I not, again, that's, that's not really a claim. I think it's just a f- I just don't fact. think you could, like... I mean... Technically, there are wars of religion going on right now. Yeah, but not or in... religiously motivated conflict. That's definitely still happening. Yeah, it's definitely still yes, happening. But... I just don't know if Western <clears throat> in in Western societies. Yeah, we you, see could, you could like rouse conflict. people to that. Uh, well, it's a massive no, ab- statement. It's I... a massive statement, yo. It's not a massive statement. I think you're quite right. Ooh. Um, I mean, it, pres- it presumes a lot about the the. Are you honestly going to imagine that the UK going into a religious war right now with each other? No, I don't, I, it just doesn't persuade... 5% of British citizens go to church. 5%? Yeah, regularly. Dang. Like, no one cares. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, no one cares, that's a bit of a claim. Hello, like, you've been issued... Yeah, the, that's a claim. The small claims court uh, doesn't actually allow you... <laughs> no, like, I think, I think one thing is, though, that they are still very... There is still a high belief in God mm. around, uh, like, in, in the UK which says that there is something that religion has got to work with. There is signs that they've got, you know, a bit of following, but it's about how they can, how they can adapt that in the modern age. Um, I think it's a very fascinating question, and one that I tried, albeit very poorly, to, uh, to tackle. I yeah. think, I guess it's more like you wouldn't, get a, you wouldn't get a conflict declared in the name of religion anymore. I don't think... Well, not in Europe, no. Like, if the Pope was to call for a crusade, I think everyone would be like, okay... Um, I think, what? yeah, <laughs> just s- simmer down, Francis. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. They'd be like, and whatever. I think I might just stay at home, yeah. <laughs> next. <laughs> Thank you, next, yeah. Just, oh, just yeah, Francis. No, please, no. Yeah. Because right now, like, everyone's dealing with the whole thing with um, the Pope where he just made a speech and he was like, yeah, 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 like, we need to crack down on all of the, you know, bad moves. Uh, if you can call it that. Yeah, um, that, yeah some very bad moves. Very so bad, not good. Understatement of the century yeah, literally. there. But yes. the thing is, he doesn't list... Historical sex abuse in the Catholic Church. <laughs> bad move. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. But he, he doesn't list any ways to fix it. He was just like, this is bad. Thank you. Next. Like, he doesn't... He didn't propose anything, which is interesting. And people well, maybe, like, may, maybe he might propose a crusade to kind of take everyone's attention away from the maybe. Uh, sex abuse. But people just... People aren't upset about it enough, I don't think. Like, some people are very, very upset. Oh, that's a, well, they're not mo- upset about sex... No, no, I'm sorry, Sarah. That is... No, it's... My point is, they're not... Like, it's not, like, a massive thing. Everyone kind of makes a lot of jokes what? about it. Like, I've Historical seen... Historical sex abuse in the Catholic Church. I've seen, like, three stand-up comedy shows in the last week where they just make jokes about the Catholic Church, and everyone's like, haha, that's funny. Yeah, that's, sh- that's, that's shocking. Shocking. Absolutely <laughs> shocking. Yeah, I think that's more about your poor taste, Sarah. More than Guys, these yeah. are famous comedians. Mm, no, I think this has been a massive thing. Arguably the greatest challenge the Catholic Church is facing. No, I know, but I'm like, my point, ref- is, my point is not that go. it is not a massive thing there for the go. Catholic I've Church. So many claims. I've said it. I've said it. Guys, this I've is a it. spicy one. My point is not that. My point is that like... You just made your point. Everyone no, but it doesn't you. seem as serious Sarah, as Sarah, you've nailed your colours to the mask, okay? You don't care about like sex abuse in the Catholic Church. Like, <laughs> I do care. I promise, listeners. I care very deeply about sex abuse in the Catholic Church. I just don't... I don't feel like it's made enough of a splash. And I think it should have made more of a splash than it's made. Claimus Maximus. Sure us? Yeah, I guess it, it's more just that people in news need to... I mean, news is very short-term focus, right? Yeah. So big, big trial, big case, big name... And it fades from memory. Yeah. And the inability of news to be able to maintain long-term agendas and tracks of time. Yeah. You know, remember, there was a time when all everyone ever talked about was Ukraine. Mm. No one's talked about Ukraine in four years, I'd say. It will take, take another flashpoint. It it's take still there. Flashpoint. Still there. Still there. Nothing since Minsk. You talk <laughs> about Syria. Everyone talked... From 2015, 16, everyone talked about Syria. That was all anyone talked about was Syria, Syria, Syria. Now, no one talks about Syria. Mm. Currently, all we talk about is Brexit. 
And okay, that might be a particularly odd case in which it will hold the agenda yeah. for decades, agreed, five years. But the trend is is that in news, editors or well, I don't know if they're not good because it's not in their. I don't know what if it's their aim to maintain long term <laughs> tracks of news coverage. Yeah. But they don't have that scope, as opposed to say a historian might. But at what point? Does it all just become well, that's history? A, that's a fascinating question, isn't it? About one which we will not be answering at all today, though, because at <laughs> yep. a record 50 minutes, I think it's probably time to introduce the topic. Oh my God, yeah, we it's did almost off. like we didn't know what we were talking about can today. We, can we note? We can, did know. Sarah, we can we note that down, though, so we have something? Yeah, to actually. Talk about. I think it's nearly time for our first song. <laughs> when does history become history? That's a good I'll question. Tune in later for that one. <clears throat> Needless to say, um, so this was, uh, we came up with this topic a while ago, needless to say. We did. And we still, I still think it's a, I think we've got some good questions on there if you look at the doc. It's an interesting topic. So basically the general premise is this idea is of interesting. geography. Now, uh, this clearly wasn't premised at someone who studies geography coming on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Or anything yeah. like that. That wasn't premised as that. Uh, instead, um, well, I guess I came across it because when I studied history uh, in between uh, seventh and tenth grade, so what's that? S one to S four. The class was called World History and Geography. Oh, they weren't separated. As Actually, concepts. that's a really good point. When I was little, it was called Histoire Geo, so it was literally History slash Geography was the name of the class. Yeah, Up that's until, true. Though, like yeah, my they, junior high school. A lot of schools do just pull them both together just to save money and time. Oh, look, these two look quite similar. Oh, let's <laughs> just you know. Yeah, it's probably not some like historiographical like. Secret agenda. No, it's more just no. Like, That's easy. They cuts. can teach them both. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I'd have loved to have learned HI two thousand and one and you know year six. Sadly, we'd all be better off. Happen. Yeah, I think no. as a consequence, I think would have been a bit too much for ten year old me. <laughs> I'd probably be here studying physics right now because I would have hated history. But yeah, no, that's that's another thing. Well, I guess like the normal thing that we normally get learnt about like with history is that from the very basis of time, it's linked to geography, right? Yeah. So I'm talking. 10,000 BC earlier, the first thing that we're really taught about is that what makes like these initial civilizations look, survive early on is rivers, True. big rivers. Euphrates and the Tigris, you've got Nile, the, the Indus Valley, Ganges, yep, and the, um, the Yellow River in China. So it's called like this, it's called the, there's a corridor that they call it between, mm -hmm. um, between the Euphrates up to the Yellow River and all the major hmm. early civilizations start around these riverbeds. So immediately, right from the moment that some people actually learn like the origins of human history, it's intrinsically linked to geography. And from there, the discussion becomes whether geography is an enabler of history uh, or an inhibitor. Do people succeed because of geography or are they inhibited because of geography? I think it's both. Actually, I was having a really interesting conversation um, like two weeks ago. I was in the, I was in the Netherlands. And we're walking around, and yeah, the boys just shared a look. Uh, I was in the Netherlands, and what, I was. What are you talking about? I just wanted to stretch my <laughs> stretch my neck. Okay, okay. Anyways, I was in the Netherlands, and we were walking around, and it was incredibly windy, like so windy. There was one point in the trip when we were literally being blown back by the wind, and I was obviously annoyed about this because I hate wind. But Claim. That's we're a, not. We're not in Netherlands. That's another Sarah. TED like, There aren't like less. you know two hundred mile an hour winds. No, it was very. It was very intense. Okay, but anyways, we were walking around, and I was like, I can't. Like, is it always like this, or is this just a bad time? And the person I was with was like, no, 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 this is just sort of what it's like. It's very, very windy. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why, why would you build a city in a location where it is this cold because of the wind all the time? And the person I was with was like, well, look at all the canals. Because we were in Amsterdam and then, and then Rotterdam. And so he was like, yeah, it makes sense because they built it here because it was right on the water. It's right on the, the North Sea. Um, you have all these canals that allow you to get around. You have all these canals that mean you can put stuff on boats and send them much faster and much easier than if you were trying to send them by, like, oxen or something. Mm -hmm. And that, therefore, people just kind of took the L with the wind because they were like, geographically, this makes far more sense. Yeah, I can't imagine, you know, the great civilizations of history being like, you know, at the start... Well, you know it's what, cold. lads? A bit windy. Don't it. <laughs> like, yeah, that I would be I me, though. If really, I was starting a civilization, I'd be like, not worth it. I don't think really going to stop these people, Sarah. But yeah, no, I, I get, I get your point. Yeah. And the same thing with San Francisco. Like that's, it's you know known as the hilly city. Some of those hills are built straight upwards, and they still chose to build a city there because of its location on the bay. Mm. Oh. And so they just kind of mm. came up with ways 
to build houses on these incredibly steep hills to get oxen up these incredibly steep hills. Like they, they just kind of adapted because they wanted the water location. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah. I, there's a couple of cases I can think of in which geography really enables. I think the one that the first comes to mind is the Industrial Revolution, oh. uh, particularly regarding coal. Mm-hmm. Coal was the fuel which powered the Industrial Revolution. Where is there the highest concentration of coal resources in Europe? Britain. Mm-hmm. Yep. Britain has the highest concentration of coal resources in Europe. And as a consequence of literally just sitting on a pile of coal, well, it makes it far easier to fuel an industrial revolution than it would otherwise. Yeah, we had to import yeah. it or something. Yeah. Uh, what was the other one I thought of? Um, no, yeah, I think it's just this general sense that um, there are cases in history in which having, geogra- like having a geographical advantage gives you an edge. Um, it, it, it can enable certain things to happen. You know, literally, the case of Spanish Armada, even without thinking about like the historical rise of nation states, Ooh. thinking about literally specific events like the Spanish Armada, the wind had been the other way. Could be speaking French, uh, Spanish right now. <laughs> French right now. Yeah. And we'll be Catholic. So. Yeah. Hola. <laughs> oh, my God. Soy short. <laughs> oh, my God. Me llamo Ari. <laughs> Dos de besos. But I think, and this is something we were talking about. And I don't know Make if you want to get more Francis into. Oh, Drake. okay, boys. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Actually. audio Francis Drake. <laughs> and I don't know if this is something we maybe want to get into later, but we were discussing this in IR the other day because the class that I'm taking in IR is European state formation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what's been really interesting is we've kind of tracked, it's a lot of sapiens, if you've read that, that book. Um, oh, yeah. Who does that book. again? Oh, my God. Uh... I should totally know this. I read this over break. Sure, is going to look it up. Anyways, um, so a lot of what we've been discussing is how um, you get like an absolute monarch in power. Because obviously all these little places around, I, I, the two that I comment on the most in class, obviously I'm sure you're shocked if you listened to this before, are Russia and France. Um, and the way that they kind of become absolute powers or, or they get absolute leaders is very interesting because obviously they start off as small little town kind of things that all spread out and then they eventually all kind of join together to form borders and to form an area where they're like, okay, all the people inside these walls, that they're ours. They're our people. And we all report to this one guy in Paris who thinks he's a sun king, but that's that. (laughs) And what's so interesting is the way that absolute monarchs are able to maintain that in like smaller states versus massive states like Russia. Like, Russia is massive. It's quite big. Oh, oh yeah. It's, it's a big boy. <laughs> really? Um, it's thick. But um, but a lot of the problems that Russia had, at least at the start, and kind of, I think Shores can comment more on this than I can, because he studied this, um, even during the, the reign of the Tsars, was that it's so big that it was tough to keep a handle on everyone. Yeah, there's a lot of scope for... You know, authority is decentralized. Mm-hmm. Um, but not politically so. Yeah. Um, so it's pol- politically centralized, but of- authority is decentralized, if that yeah. makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and that means that it means that it takes a lot of time for there to become the formation of a centralized government. In fact, it doesn't actually happen under the Tsars. It takes like the most momentous bit of state creation in the 20th century. Oh, my. Oh, there we go. In the claims. Oh, yeah, that's, prob- that's probably a claim. But you know, probably. I mean, okay, fine. Well, to, to go from in five years, to go from a Tsar. Zardom, emperor, em, em, empires to a fully functioning Soviet state based on like Marxist Leninism. But the difference is they kept, especially in the first couple of years, they kept a lot of the same things that the czars had. Um, and we've kind of talked about yeah. this because I'm taking my class in the Soviet Union right now. They kept like a lot of the structural stuff that the czars had had. Um, so it wasn't actually that different because they were just kind of like, well, we have to ease everyone into communism. Yeah, Did it's, they it's do not that? Really, yeah, no. you can't really change it overnight, can you? It's, no. it's, a, it's a big old, uh, war, commun- old deal. Uh, war communism. Oh my god, war communism. Isn't that oh. technically like the most full blown it could have got? And that was like in what, 1980? Yeah, but at the same time, they also had that period where they were like, okay, look, it's kind of capitalist peasants, like, <laughs> make but, yeah, your grain. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, new, the new economic policy, but that was after war communism. NEP. NEP. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So that it went from communist. Cause went I, from ultra communist. Yeah, it went from ultra communist. Ultra communist to the like NEP. Kind of capitalist. So then they're like, okay, like now we're in communism. But um, even then, the question of capitalism in Tsarist Russia it was, is, is a hugely controversial topic about, about the origins of it and the formation of it and whether there was an inevitability, whether it was state-run. It's, mm. um, it's, 
sorry, it's getting away from the point title, but the, uh, yeah. right, the point being I mean, is that... What year was Adam Smith? How new was capitalism, period, under the czars? True. Like, as a concept. Well, to, 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 in, is, you've got... With Russia, it's always in comparison to Europe. Mm. Exactly. So, it, <laughs> again, another another good geographical point there. Yeah. Well, yeah. How each country associates themselves, sees themselves. That is an excellent point. As the East versus the West. Russia always has that problem. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Russia is well, the main one for that. Well, yeah. actually, there no, are no, because the other problem is that we call Eastern Europe Eastern Europe. That being like you know, it's east of us. East of us. Yeah. It's all exactly. about. All Whereas about the perception. people in Eastern Europe that I know call it Central Europe, and they get very upset if you call it Eastern Europe. Well, they. Where do they think Eastern Europe is? Russia. Yeah, I remember. I remember my Middle East history tutor last year. He was from Japan. He referred to the Middle East as Southwest Asia. I was like, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, Mr. I shouldn't be swearing. But yeah. <laughs> a I was like, it just it just shows it. It, it blows your mind. Like, yeah, South- I, yeah, I have heard that. Yeah, that. it's like yeah. who, what? That's not that's not well, that's yeah. not right. The, well, but obviously, for, for a Japanese person, it is Southwest Asia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, where's the Middle East? Yeah, <sighs> true. Well, like, isn't it Churchill who nicknamed it the Middle East? Like, did they choose to be called that? No, middle of what East? Come on now. <laughs> and then where does it start and where does it end? Perception is crucial in these is, things. Is yeah. Turkey and Iran in the Middle East? <sighs> sure, as is we can The Arabian spend... Peninsula in the Middle East? <sighs> Academics what about the Maghreb? centuries trying Actually, to... Actually, speaking of East and West, this kind of reminded me of something that I, I heard the other day that I thought was the most bizarre thing ever. So I was, I was talking to someone and they were like, oh, yeah, 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 you just turn West and then East. And I was like, huh? They were like, yeah, to get to this location, like you turn west and then you turn east. And I realized that, and it is a person from Russia, I will say that on record. Um, they were describing it as west as in left and east as in right. But that's how they were like quantifying it was literally in mm. terms of directions. Which I was like, that's wild that to me. That makes no sense because if you, you, if you walk east and then walk west, you're just going back on yourself. Are you? Yeah, that's... I no? mean, you need, you need a compass to crack these directions. Aren't you? Is, right. It's all I'm unless saying. Unless you like turn like 180 degrees, and then, and then you're going yeah, the same like, way. Unless you're thinking, unless you turn 90 degrees, unless, and then it's like unless you're considering it as your own compass. You are yeah. your own compass. That 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 was the concept. But then why don't you just use left and right then? Exactly. That's what don't I thought. It. But he was like, no, it just makes more sense to me to use west and east. And it was just a whole thing of like, the, like he, you know, you were defining it in and of yourself as in terms of you, what was west and what was east, which is basically what Europe has done. Is we've mm. looked at we've looked at everything and been like, well, that's west of us, that's east of us, that's yeah. north of us, that's south of us. The prim- Welcome to the world. The prime meridian literally comes out of Greenwich in London. Yeah, I mean, it's very convenient for us. Very but, useful. Yeah. Mm. All time is relative to us. <laughs> <laughs> we are the center everything of the world. Is, yeah. Everything is either one hour. <laughs> is either is it, hours yeah. away from hours us behind or, behind or hours ahead? Yeah, everyone else is. Oh, Irrelevant, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's what occurred to me. It was, it's basically the same thing. Is he was defining his sense of direction based off of where he stood, and that's, and you know, that's very weird to us when we think about it from one individual person doing that. But that is history. Like realistically, that's what we've all done. So mm. we're like that's the Middle East because it's to the east of us, but it's in the middle of what we consider the proper East East. Yeah, I mean, Russia has that problem. Turkey also has that problem. Yeah, Turkey, because it doesn't. Yeah. Where's well, the gateway to both? Because it can't figure out if it's Europe or Asia. It keeps oscillating, arguably. It occasionally tries to join the European Union. You could argue about <laughs> right, right now that it's drifting back towards. It's more kind of, Eastern. Yeah, more Eastern. Erdogan. More authoritarian. Yeah. Alluding to sultans of old. Mm. Of oh the, my god. Mm-hmm, maybe you might can, be we have, can we have a jar? We have to put a coin in every time you mention the Ottomans. Hey, hey, they're really cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, in fairness to him, that is the first time he's, he's mentioned it this, uh, this year, I'd say. Uh, yeah, I just go to lunch with well, him and Harrison once a week where that's all they talk about. Yeah, because they're really cool. And it has a lot of significance bearing on other ones' foreign and domestic policy. Mm. Okay. Especially relations with the Balkans. Okay, thank Particularly. you for that. Should we move on to our song of the week? <laughs> I think we should. In our smoothest transition, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh mm. yeah, that was, that was smooth, guys. We really nailed okay. that one. All right, in that case then, enjoy everyone. It's a bit of a cop-out, but oh well. Enjoy. We like it. Beautiful. Wow. And we're back. Yes. Well, guys, I'm going to warn you right now, the information I have about this song is spicy. <laughs> we love spiciness in the show, Sarah. Don't worry. What song it is. That was Imagine. <laughs> please, please That was please Imagine by uh, What Jonathan. was that one? <laughs> I really hope you know what that was. Um, it was written in 1971 in <laughs> at his uh, Lennon's 
Tittenhurst Park Estate in Ascot, Berkshire, England. Berkshire. Oh my God. Okay. Berkshire. Wow. Whatever. You just, Listen you up. Just folks. Said, you also said oh Lenin God. like Lenin. <laughs> Whatever. Do you want me to say? That's the worst spelling of Berkshire I've ever heard. Oh, I think <laughs> I'm traumatized. Berkshire. That. Anyways, you guys put me in charge of this. All right. Not my fault. I don't know how to pronounce oh, any of these things God. correctly. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> about this song, uh, Lenin stated. Imagine there was that there was no more religion, no more country, no more politics. It's virtually the communist manifesto. Even though I'm not particularly a communist uh, and I do not belong to any movement. This is Lenin. This is a quote from him. There's no real communist state in the world. You must realize that. This is at the time of the Soviet Union. Uh, um, is this John Lennon? Yeah, this is a quote by him. Wow. Uh, the socialism I speak about is not the way some Get daft... Claims. Hold on, I'm not done yet. <laughs> the socialism I speak about is not the way some daft Russian might do it or <laughs> or the Chinese might do it. That might suit them. Uh, us, we should have nice British socialism. Mm, okay, yeah, one, interesting. Uh, so then Ono, who's Mr. one of the Corbyn. people that helped him <laughs> write the song, <laughs> so then one of the people who helped Lennon write the song described the lyrical statement of Imagine as, and I quote, just what John believed, that we are all one country, one world, one people. Now isn't that interesting given our geography topic today? Indeed. So yeah, <laughs> like a, yeah, a pluralist global hub, hub of music. Of everyone actually working together. And just together. loving each other and, you know, working together. And oh, so a massive commune. Exactly. Turning perhaps, the world into a massive commune. Perhaps, okay. like all the toys in Toy Story hanging out together, despite all of their differences. Did they work together? Yeah, I think they, yeah, they, they worked did, together. They? they did. Yeah, but... Maybe, yeah, there were, like, did. some discrepancies, More. but, like, a cowboy was friends with uh, with Buzz Lightyear, so I feel like that works out. Yeah, but, like... That's cool. I mean, the, Buzz Lightyear's literally from outer space. They had differences, but I think and they at the end of the day, they, they, they all got along. They, the they, com- they, they were working towards the same And goal. they're all from different places, and they still but all But what is that commune working towards in his toy box? To give and Andy have- pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> He's a child. Oh He's a little God. child. For God's sake, stop laughing, okay? Oh, my God. They He's want- a child. That was their job Someone to give Andy. Someone called the Catholic Church. To give church. Andy, yeah, obviously for you, you don't care about child <laughs> sex abuse, but yeah. That's not even a claim. Why are you putting that down? <laughs> I was going to say, that was their job. They wanted to oh give him joy. Oh, my God. Yeah, oh, okay, we, we get it. We bad, get it. They wanted to give him sickos, joy. You lot. You're such sickos. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, that was. I'm glad that he was, was like eight years recorded. old. Yeah, we insane. know. Please stop belaboring the point. He's a child. Actually, in the third film, he goes off to college, so he's like 18 in that one. That is true. That's an. There is that one. scene where he's like on his laptop, and then his mom kind of walks in. And he's like, oh. <laughs> oh my God. But anyway, we digress. <laughs> <laughs> right, geography. Geography. <laughs> geography, geography. Back to the point. Back to geography. Um, yes, all of this is true. Oh my God, we didn't even do this week in history. Oh my god, we didn't. Yeah, we've we got, got so, a lot to catch up on. We, got, we got so embroiled. Mine is exciting and does relate to geography. Go on then, Saz. All right, so mine is this day in history, the Zimmerman telegram. So if you guys know what that is, that was basically where the Germans sent Mexico telegram. They're like, hey, we'll help you out. Like, if you can just, like, invade the U.S. for us. Like, just get rid of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, just invade the U.S. for us. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> easy, <laughs> easy money, really, a Mexico in small favor. And we'll give Once you we've done Paso. braining Trotsky, oh, exactly. like, yeah. And on this day in history, the Zimmerman telegram was presented to the U.S. ambassador, who was like, well, that's just rude. And then they went off. And that's interesting because geography, they wanted them to invade. That was some really bad PR. Thank, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I just, how that was, I why was that, that smart? Nazi committee meeting, like, yeah, let's uh, try to persuade one. the Mexicans to invade. Mobile one. Oh, false. Well, even still, Mexico in, like, 1914. I mean, like, in 15, I think it was sent, wasn't it? It was picked up in 16, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Against the US. like The US wasn't even properly involved. They were land- No, that, that's the point. They were land leasing to the Well, so just like, UK. just uh, uh, unnecessarily anger the US and get them involved. Just yeah. put Pearl Harbor yeah, them before Pearl no, Harbor. Yeah. Wow. I, it well, was in 1917 actually, it was discovered, well, by the way. Isn't that interesting? Because on this day in history, the Alamo began. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I saw that and I was like, oh, not the Alamo. So uh, in 1936. Who could forget the I Alamo? Know, what, what did, I don't even know the context of what Mexico just... Yeah. Was this the Mexican? What was this? Mex- Mexican 1836. Yeah, War. the Mexican American War. Yeah, yeah, over Texas, right? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, Texas was initially American, then it was independent. No, it was, it was initially Mexican. Then yeah. went independent. Then was like annexed by the U.S. And then Mexico was like, "Hang on, we don't want to be." And then uh, you know. And then the Alamo happened, where what several thousand Mexican troops uh, took on uh, American garrison at the Alamo. Didn't quite work uh, out. Did not did work out for the Americans. None of them that's, survived. That's why we remember the Alamo. Yes, because it didn't work out. Yeah, and it, we're like, oh, they died fighting for 
Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Which we snatched. So. Well, they joined peacefully. <laughs> they wanted to join. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were there on their own will. <laughs> America doesn't have a good history of that, but it's fine. <laughs> Well, okay. Other things that happened. Um, uh, yes, so um, kind of on the geographical theme, uh, yesterday, 330 years ago, William III, or William of Orange, was proclaimed King of England following, obviously, the Glorious Revolution. Obviously, the revolution in which no blood was spilt, hence yeah. its being glorious and well, James II, deposing the vicious Catholic James II. And this was James Stuart, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was. Yes, the brother of Charles II. Actually, uh, hold on. Well, no, it's not not the James the first James Stuart, but he was also called James. But was he was and Stuart? of the Stuarts and of the Stuart lineage, yeah. Oh, but mm. but like, he's the lesser remembered James. He was yeah. consistently considered one of the worst the kings in British James. history because he was Catholic he ruled for like two years and he was Catholic in a country of Protestants. Yes. Everyone hated him. Um, everyone hates Catholics. Yeah, I know. But William of Orange came over, and obviously being a hardcore Protestant, you know. <laughs> My British history is so bad. Yeah. It really is terrible. That's that, like, what you do going to an American high school, Shoras. Like, yeah. yeah. And also then studying places I've literally never visited. And then obviously he ruled uh, jointly with, uh, oh, what's her name? Mary. Uh, Mary, Mary the second, of course, yeah. Um, until she died and then he ruled for a while on his own uh, and then died himself. So um, bosh, 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 as very did. significant moment, really, in, yeah. in kind of seminal moment, some would say, in, in British history. Yeah. The only other thing that I could really note down, t- not, t- not too much happened today. Mexico gained independence oh. in we, You guys are really honing in on this whole Mexico, US Yeah, we didn't even plan of, that. Yeah, we didn't plan it. Like, this just happened. And we should the, declare a state of emergency. And the other oh, one, oh. which is that the Cuban War of Independence began in 1895. I think that's just tied into the uh, Spanish-American War, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so Mexico, wow. But yeah, um, that was all that we could think of really that happened today in history. Yeah, so I think the lesson we... is don't send people telegrams about invading other countries that they could share. Mm. So, Especially if that country's Mexico just don't and you try to invade country. the just, like, USA. Just stay in your own lane. Like, you don't need to invade other countries. So, <laughs> don't, don't give in to what the Kaiser wants. <laughs> so here's, it's a bad idea. So here's the question, right? How come. The, what we can, what we call the old world in, in historiography, but so what, I re- European but what, I re- what, I re- what I really mean is Europe, Asia, Africa. Mm-hmm. How come there developed housing, infrastructure, civilizations, empires on the level that we know of mm. way before what happened in North and South America, or to the extent that it was traveling oceans? That's a good question. Because I watched a video about it, oh. which said the only real reason why was because the animals there were less tameable. And that was the only reason. And he, it followed a very specific line of argument that went, if you have domesticated animals, then you can plow fields. And you have fields, then you can have towns. Mm. And if you have mm. towns, then you have animals and people living in close quarters together. And if you have that, then you have plagues. Oh, the plague. Actually, wait. Somehow Hold we on. always come back. Hold on. I fr- phrased this the wrong way. I'm making it sound like, has like how come there's civil- civilization, in quotation marks, in the West and the old world, but not in the new world. What I actually mean is, how come there was no America pox? Does that make sense? I don't know, sure. So, oh. so when, so for, for context, when <laughs> predominantly Spain, but also later France and Britain, uh, Colonized, loaded term, I know. Um, <laughs> just, just, just for now, let's go along with the it. old, the old and new, uh, the new worlds so in North and South America. Ninety plus percent of the native population died of Yikes. disease. <laughs> of disease. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Not, not, not massacre or ge- mm-hmm. anything close. To what we call genocide. Enslaved, certainly oppressed. Yes. Oh yeah. But the vast majority of people were killed by diseases. Yeah. It's like an inadvertent genocide. It was yeah. accidental yeah. genocide. Oh. Biological of such. Yeah. Small plucks, the common cold wiped out a staggering amount of people. So yeah. the question is really, is what, how come when explorers returned to Europe, we got syphilis and that was it? I'm pretty sure syphilis... Wasn't was syphilis doing... just an STI? Yeah. I don't know if you mm-hmm. got that from like... <laughs> 
yeah, anchors. Apparently, like, apparently, yeah. apparently, apparently that came back, but that oh, really? that, oh, that was enough. that oh, was I. that was Candide Voltaire by Voltaire. So it oh, might have been a bit satirical. Not uh, <laughs> sure, as I, I, I'll be honest, not I'm not I'm not a biologist. I, I don't know how these things work. Well, this is how um, the video played it out. Was well, it's just a case of domesticate animals. All about domesticating animals. So animals in Europe well, were domesticated. We, we did domesticate animals, I think, more in sort of Europe um, than a lot of other places. Because if you read Sapiens, he kind of talks about that, where he traces in the beginning where we're all kind of like hunter-gatherers, we move around, and then eventually we start, you know, we find like grain or whatever, and we're like, ah, uh-huh. if we just stay here, we can produce mass quantities of this. And then we don't have to, you know, look for as much food. Which, first of all, the argument that it's Ansari, actually, that's his name. Oh, uh, Ansari. No. <laughs> oh my god, guys. No. Well, the, 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 the point, point is. So you're saying they, that Europeans were lazy and they just no, stay in the same place? Is it that, yeah, they and eventually they just become domesticated mm. and they start just like taking animals and keeping them there as like livestock instead of having to go chase but them. But it's not even that. It's that the animals were just better to domesticate. In, in, the, in the old Yuval, world. Uh, I definitely am going to butcher this. I'm so sorry. Yuval Noah Harari. That's the guy. Right? Harari? Oh, what? Sapiens. Harari. Sapiens. Oh, I thought you said there. Harari. Capital of Zimbabwe. Yeah. What's that got to do with anything? <laughs> so the point is, is that in North America, the animal that you can domesticate is a buffalo. Don't know if you've seen a buffalo or a bison, as they're also called. I have. Who was I we talking to yesterday in, when we were discussing we have the, them national, in San we were talking about the national animals of... Uh, yeah. Of uh, various countries. Apparently, America's national animal is the bison, which is quite ironic considering they killed all of them. But, yeah. yeah. But oh well. No. So in North America, you know, they have llamas. North, North and South America. America. Sorry, North and South say. America. <laughs> what? What? The point. The point is, is that the. Whereas in Europe, you have cows, pigs, sheep, goats. Okay. Dogs. Not horses in some areas. In. You have all these animals that you can domesticate and use for farmland, and that leads to mm. the consequence of towns. Yeah. But. And an important caveat is is that, that those animals then live in the towns. And what that allows that for is that it allows for far more opportunities. Into kind of interspersing. Mm. Well, it, it, yeah. we're, leading, we're leading now into virology. I was going to say interbreeding there for a no, minute. What, <laughs> it, what, what it allows for is... Maybe in, maybe in the West Country, I don't know. <laughs> That's going in the country. Ah. But it, um, Any Bristolians watching, I'm, I'm so sorry. But what it... What it listening, sorry. <laughs> watching. Oh, ah. But what the point is, is that when you have lots of animals in an uh, urban environment, is it allows for far greater opportunity for diseases that are normally mm. carried by animals to jump to humans and then become lethal. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, case in point, Ebola is an initial lot of disease found in apes, and they think that literally they just... that, that the crossover happened in an Ebola. Case in point also with... So you have cows and pigs and sheep all living in these towns, mm. but in North America, because then they haven't had... Because so there was like a separation in North America. Because there's not been any animals to domesticate, to hence farming, hence towns, hence live with yeah. the animals, their immune systems were nowhere near as geared towards having to deal with these kinds of plagues mm. and infections. And as a consequence of that, that there, there is this idea that purely because of that llamas are hard to <laughs> look after. Yeah, yeah spring that, llamas. <laughs> you know, 90% of Europe wasn't wiped out when explorers returned. That's an interesting thought. I, yeah. I'll be honest, I didn't really pay much attention to that. Well, no, like the actual subject. Obviously, I was, obviously I was listening <laughs> to you, Sean. We tuned out when you listen. But like, that, it, yeah. it was something that never really occurred to me. But. So, this, yeah. so this is the idea. I, if you want to check out, it's, you can find this video on YouTube by a guy uh-huh. called CPG Grey. He talks about it in a lot more detail. But um, yeah, so this is one real pertinent example of how geography can be used as like a, a factor in the development yeah. of, as a historical factor, sorry. Yeah. Of where, yeah. of where, for sure, literally for sure. something as simple as domesticating animals, but the I fundamental think, of that can completely alter the the timeline. Well, I think what's also important to talk about. It's time for my weekly plague reference. Mm. Um, that's how that happened. Is is you know, a rat brought that over on a boat, and it just spread like wildfire because everyone was so closely packed into these places that it just spread. This is an important caveat, though, is that this does kind of overestimate. We are, I feel like, we're portraying the urbanization in Europe in the Middle Ages That's as sort true. of mm. like everyone's just like squashed in there. But yeah. Like, well, it was it was a very still still quite was, a rural that, yeah. rural culture oh, though. But, but like, it was still rural. Yeah. Less than five percent was urbanized. Yeah. Like yeah. towns are still tiny. But the plague still spread because of the way that the towns were constructed was that people were kind of on top of one another. 
and you know there was no sewer system there sanitation. was no yeah no well, sanitation yeah, that, that, they, they so did that, a lot of bad things yeah, yeah. yeah there were some problems yeah. so it just spread like absolute welfare and again that, that's another geographical factor yeah yeah for sure for sure certainly um, well, I think only Poland Poland didn't get the, get the Black Death too badly they got a lot of other stuff. They got a lot yeah, of other no, things throughout karma, their history. Karma like, came yeah. back for them. Like, <laughs> <laughs> they did not get off scot free. Like, no, no, they may have survived yeah. the plague. Of all the bullets but... to dodge, that was probably not the one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You would have just surely if you're Poland, just get 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 your bad luck out of the way. Then just yeah. have, have a yeah. black death. We'll have the plague. Kill half your population, and, and then, then uh, avoid the whole Russia Germany sandwich. Yeah, oh precisely. God, yeah. yeah. Oh well. But oh well. <laughs> to get to move on to completely different things. I just wanted to bring again up. geography Poland. Just, That's unfortunate oh, geography that, there. That right. is true. Yeah. They were straight in the middle of, of two yeah, fascist two big boys. communism, yeah. mm. battle of the century. Mm. Do you think also people attempt to manipulate geography in order to change history? Hannibal Go on. going across the Alps with elephants <laughs> because he was like, they won't see that one coming, <laughs> so he decided to walk across the Alps. Was that intelligent? Meh, maybe not. There is a skit by Eddie Izzard, who's a comedian. Mm. Sorry, we right. know who Eddie Izzard is. Mm. He's talking why. about um, about Hannibal crossing the Alps, and he apparently walks into a shop and says, "Have you got any skis?" Yeah, exactly. Like, no, no, we've got no skis. Got a couple of elephants. Yep. It's like what? <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> <He's> like, yeah, <laughs> catch us on some elephants. Got a load of elephants. It's like, can they ski? <laughs> yeah, so I think exactly. Like I think people try to try to manipulate geography, and it does not always work. <laughs> Soviet Union, Aral Sea. Mm. Tried to use uh, tries to use irrigation techniques to divert water from the Aral Sea to make uh, what was essentially steppe arable land. No, didn't work at all. I did really? actually work in SF though. We built a San, lot of our San Francisco mar- for San the, Francisco. Uh, okay, for the non-natives. Yeah, it, we built a lot of our marina off of like garbage, basically. Wow. The Dutch as well doing it now. Yeah, that's so real. And they're also like what's so cool about Amsterdam because um, as I said earlier, I was just there. Um, is that a lot of these houses are kind of sinking into the canals. Mm. And so they're having to come up with ways to like either bolster them or let that one go. Yeah. Or But you can literally see, if you walk around, some of the buildings are like tilted because they're sinking. And that's something the Dutch are going to have to deal with. But they've, they've gotten so good at dealing with that kind of a thing that they're being brought in to, to like smaller... I think it was islands, I was told, around the world to do the same thing because th- those are going underwater. And yeah. the Dutch are so experienced with having to combat that mm. that they're, you know, they're going in. Oh, now the, and now the world experts are doing it everywhere else. Exactly. And they are like the consultants for mm. my land is sinking. Yeah. <laughs> Someone help. <laughs> Which is a my weird thing to be an expert in. Oh. I mean, I, I won't do much good though because I think if sea temperatures rise by two degrees then all of Shanghai and Bangladesh will be underwater along with all of Florida. So That's a bit of an see, issue, isn't it? Yeah. Go see Again. Shanghai and Bangladesh yeah. while Geography. you can. Geography. Wow. Geography. That is a huge thing. In, in events leading up, climate refugees. Oh, yeah. If you think it's bad... If, if you think thing, things were bad or were startling yeah, and precisely. shocking now, that's yeah. when whole countries start to disappear. Bangladesh, mm. how many people? 170 million? Yes. Yeah. In Bangladesh? Bigger than Russia. Yeah, no. All of them on the move because the entire coastal area, gone. Yeah. Shanghai. Kolkata's going to have fun there. Shanghai, well. 25 million people, gone. Yeah. So how many people live in Florida? No idea. <laughs> I don't think anyone will really care, but oh well. No. Yeah, true. true. <laughs> Good to see Shores being divisive as well. They'll, they'll incorporate Puerto Rico instead, it'll be fine. 50 cents once again. <laughs> oh my god. Either way. Um, I think to kind of, we are getting close to the end. I think it's time for us to go to everyone's favorite section. Oh, it is. Mine. Oh, we my, love it here. Mine's kind of chunky. Yeah. Freak of the week. Freak yeah. de la week. Wow. I'm, I'm Sarah, prepared. as your claim of chunkiness has been it is, acknowledged. It is chunky. Um, okay, so the thing is, mine is not one person. But well, surely that's that's contradictory. No, hold on, hold on. It's it's the Vori, if you guys know what that is, which is like a Russian super mafia kind of. That's it's a book that I'm currently reading, and there was a passage the other day that I was like, that is the most disgusting and weird thing I've ever heard. So I was like, that's what I want to. That's what my freak kind of thing is. But it's a thing that that they would do. So basically, the Vori are like very intense criminals, um, and the background for what you need to know for what I'm about to tell you about them is that they would have tattoos. And they would be covered in tattoos. This is like in the gulags, post gulags, that kind of thing. And the tattoos you had to earn them. Nineteen so sixties. Yeah, but but it yeah. I mean, it's when they're called the Vori, but they're they're kind of always a thing. Um, they just kind of evolve. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but so this is the specific part is about in the gulags. But um, so they would have these tattoos mm-hmm. that they would have on. And you had to like earn the tattoos, and it was kind of like your resume for what kind of like a baddie you were. <laughs> and so this this is a part from the book where I was like, this is insane. Um, so the most extreme tattoos, such as barbed wire across the forehead or don't wake on the eyelids, could hardly be hidden, and that was intentional. The extensive tattooing, often done in the gulag with makeshift needles sanitized simply by passing through a flame and using ink mixed from soot and urine, was done to symbolize wow. not just okay. a permanent commitment to the vori, but also manliness. It was painful and carried the risk of septicema. The aforementioned, oh, hold that's on, unfortunate. the aforementioned okay. don't wake tattoo, and so this is the eyelids one, uh, involves sliding a spoon under the eyelid before the inking. Oh. You needed to demonstrate your willingness to endure pain and risk your life, as well as your separation from the world outside, so like regular people, to be a true vor, or the vori. And so that that's an extract from The Vori, Russia Super Mafia, by wow. Mark Galeotti. Um, but yeah, that's my kind of freakish thing of the week. That's kind of freakish. That's um, incredibly freakish. the islands you refer to Sakhalin, um, to what, do you, what do you mean by islands? No, eyelids. Oh, eyelids. eyelids, yeah. Yeah, no, not eyelids. Your eyelids. You okay. had to slide a spoon under oh. them Remi- to then tattoo the top of it. Remind- and again, there's <sighs> no there's no way to sanitize this, and there is no painkiller. You just have to take one for the team. Reminds me of uh, that scene from Indiana Jones. Which one? Film, um, when he's in class, and his students uh, yeah. pass eyelids. Love says, you or Love something. You. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Not a tattooed eye or whatever it is. Right? Right, right. I think someone just drawn that on. Yeah. Well, Not it, really says, it says don't of. wake, mm. is what it says, that's, across the eyelids. Okay, that's lovely. Okay, Do you thanks, know, Have you got yourself a free Yeah, I've, I've whipped out one. Uh, Justin II, uh, emperor, 6th century emperor of uh, the Byzantine Empire. Um, he, you know what I'm is that Justinian? <laughs> no, no, Justin II, he's, he's here. Can you show us? Can we, can we just, like... Can we, can we just go with this? All right. <laughs> yeah, he was um, pretty bad schizophrenic. Uh, people had to play organ music. His servants would play organ music uh, to like sort of drown out the voices in his head. Apparently, oh he God. would hide under his bed to kind of hide from the voices in his head. So yeah, yeah, he had it pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so and a, a way of combating this, these servants would uh, make like a makeshift uh, throne on wheels and like ride him around his palace. Uh, delighting him, almost like a toddler. Or like from uh, a favorite. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah, funny guy, funny guy. Sorry, yes, sorry, Harry, for that aggressive typing. <laughs> I just thought you got confused. I thought there were... I, I, I was just quite aggressive all around, to be well, honest, sure. Like, yeah. You know, just went questioning off. my that's validity that's of, you know, my freak of the week. I know I'm not a history student, but... Well, I just heard just, <laughs> just, in sec- just in sixth century Byzantium, I was like, oh, no, he's not confused Justinian, has he? But no, no. What sorry. do you think I am? Some amateur. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, all right, so, sure is. Yeah, so mine is, as you can expect, an absolute wild card. Um, oh <laughs> Al Hakim, sure. Fatimid Imam oh Caliph my God. from so 10th, 11th century Egypt, 996 to 1021. Uh, big believer in asceticism. So he would wander <laughs> into the flex. desert at night. Um, I'll get back to that later. He destroyed, <laughs> he destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, oh. in Jerusalem, Very which nice. for those in don't know, contains uh, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ and also uh, the site where he was crucified. So quite an important site, mm. and he destroyed it. Um, <laughs> fair enough, nice. fair enough. He banned the sale of beer into the country. Raisins were what? all... No. Oh. <laughs> raisins, dead, chat. raisins were completely banned as well. Why? Um, raisins. Um, <laughs> and, I hate raisins. And he... Um, I think also all honey was banned as well. Uh... I think if you were a Jewish or Christian, you had to wear a black turban, and he destroyed every church in Egypt. Um, oh. Yeah, he was quite, he's often referred to as Heem the Mad. One yeah. day in 1021, February the 13th, 1021. Oh, Valentine's Eve. Yes, oh. indeed. Well, he was going for a, a walk of solitude, so to speak, in the desert. Oh, yeah, scary. I love And uh, <laughs> on, on his donkey, and uh, he never appeared again. Oh. He just disappeared. Wow, that sounds convenient. He some, walked yeah. into the North Sea and this never is, came back. This is the, the caliph study. of the Fatimids. So like the most dominant power the in, guy, the, yeah. in the early 11th he century. Went, went on a walk. And the he OG just dude. disappeared and no one knows what happened to him. <laughs> so, I uh, think someone knows what happened to him, but someone probably, knows. probably be resigned think, to history, unfortunately. Uh, some, people accuse, some people accuse his half-sister. Others accuse the sect called the Druze, who now reside in uh, Syria and Lebanon. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> no one really knows, to be honest. But yeah, Hakim the Mad Caliph. 
is my freak of the what a thriller to finish on. Beer. So a, yes, a point of a point of contention. Alas, right? I think that is the end of this week's episode. Right, we've somehow uh, made it through an hour talking about a subject we had very little knowledge of. Oh, I'm that's impressed. That's always three of us. Yeah. None of us take geography. I want to go on record. With that affi- one. I think we're always aficionados in what we do. Yeah, oh, yeah. Sure. I think I think very professional. I think we are sure. Yeah. Yes, but anyways, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you very much. I've had another you. lovely time joining. Uh, we'll being see all you all next week. Until next week. Sayonara. Thank mm-hmm. you.